proud and thankful church. Thank you. Thank you for the time that you gave Connie and I. I had a hard time at day 15. I had a real hard time. And uh, I didn't realize how bad I needed it. And about 15, I had, to, I had to realize that God was doing a work inside of me. And he did. And uh, here is what I come away with in this sabbatical. If you can tell, I'm very passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am so passionate about it that I will almost offend people sometimes. Can I have an amen? That's why God raised me up in my calling. That's my purpose and that's my place. Today, all of our churches are dying in America because everybody loves their ministry more than they love the gospel. God didn't call us to love ministry. God called us to love Jesus. Amen? So you pray for me because I know with the weight that I'm bearing right now, and I know that, God has shown me I'm not supposed to let up, shut up, be quiet, back up, or make people feel good. God has called me to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to challenge you with that same gospel mandate that is supposed to go to all our people so our children don't die and go to hell. Amen? Amen? I was kind of hoping I'd mellow out a little bit on this in 30 days, but that is not going to happen. Uh, today, we're going to stop the clock. Can you just stop that thing? Uh, and uh, A powerful movement of God, and, and, and in this... Uh, in this miracle, it is amazing to see that what we're going to see. And I want to give you this illustration before we stand and we read Scripture. We went to this one place and we were camping, and it was a beautiful place. Man, it was just beautiful. And we were hidden behind trees, and we were hidden in, this, in the middle of the campground. I'm not a middle of the campground type of person. I want to be on the end and have a view. I'm not a valley camper. I'm a mountaintop camper. Church, when we become to where we're feeling so sorry for ourselves and everything's wrong in our life and everything's messing up, you become a valley camper and all you can see is the hurt and the pain that's right outside of your door. And that's all you look at all the time. God called us to be mountaintop campers. When we're on the mountaintop, we can see the next blessing that's coming. We got to go through the valley to get it, but the next blessing is coming. I am not a valley dweller. I am a mountaintop camper. That's who I am. I'm going to get on the mountaintop and I'm going to keep striving because God didn't create us to live in the valley. That's where we grow from. But he gets us in the valley so he can get us to the next mountaintop. Amen? So in saying that, what is the next powerful movement of God, the next mountaintop experience? Don't become humdrum with your relationship with Jesus. That, that contradicts Scripture. We're supposed to be more on fire for God with the next day He gives us. But Brother Joey, I know I have so many struggles and so much pain. If you would use your pain and your struggles for why God sent it to you in the first place, you could move on to the mountaintop. These are some things that God has shown me. Today, let's stand for the reading of God's holy word. If you love Jesus this morning, say amen. amen. Let's say it like we believe it. I believe the word of God. I, believe the word of God. I, trust, in I trust in God's promises to mold me, mold me. to strengthen me, Strength. to encourage me, encourage to, me. Save me. to save me, and to send me. Today I will listen. Today I will learn. Today we're going to be in John chapter 5, verses 1 through, I'm going to read through 16. But it's about a man healed at the pool of Bethesda. Powerful, powerful miracle. And I want to say this, if your salvation is not powerful, then it's not Jesus. If your salvation is not powerful, it's not Jesus. Here's what the scripture says, after this there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the movement of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there 
who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Let me stop. If you're struggling with something this morning, do you want to be made well? Is there anything too hard for God? The only way that you will stay in your present condition is if you leave here because you don't have belief enough to believe that God can do what he promises. Verse 7, the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down in front of me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, Who is this man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Let's pray. Father God, we are your people. And God, I am proud to be your people. And I am honored to be your people. Father, that last song we sang preached this message. We have freedom. But today, people who are saved don't realize what we have freedom for. What we have freedom, how it came to be, why it came to be. God, today, set me behind, hide me behind your cross. Let me preach this word so where it lays out clearly what an, salvation really is. And what is expected of us as a result of you being in us. So, Father God, thank you for this body. Thank you for this church. God, thank you that I get to be the pastor of Union 3 Baptist Church. But there are families standing out here right now. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict us about what needs to change. What we need to praise. What we need to give you honor and praise for today. Father, you come in power. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You know, the first thing I want to look at is the distraction from the miracle. When you're looking at this, this guy was sitting and waiting for a miracle. There's a lot of people today that's sitting and waiting on a miracle. And now for him to do it is one thing. For us to do it is another. The miracle has already happened. The miracle for us has already took place. And we're going to make that very clear through this message. This guy had an infirmity of 38 years. Now, I don't know if he's 38 years old. I'm not sure. A cripple. Your, your, your text may say several things. But I know this. This man was sitting there and he was believing Now, do I believe that there was an angel that stirred the water? Well, angel has ministered all through the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament, yes, that is quite possible. Is it possible that healing took place there? Yeah, it's certainly possible. But here's what I want to set up. The Sheep Gate is a place that started with Nehemiah building the wall. One of the first things that one of the priests built. The Sheep Gate was outside, it was not inside. That means they were sitting and they were waiting. Some believed it was there for washing of sheep. Others later on believed it was there for the drinking of water. And I'm not sure about all that, but I can tell you this. There's a lot of different commentators that say a lot of different things. All I know is this. The sheep gate was there. This man and many people were sitting. And it was like a uh, colonnade, like, like shade. And they were sitting and they were sick and lame and the paralyzed and the, and the blind. And the, the people were sitting all around just wanting God to do something amazing in our life. Church, there are so many people going to be coming to churches this morning and they're just waiting on God to do something in their life, but they don't realize what's really distracting them. You see, the healing and the power of God is already available for us. We have freedom, but we don't understand what that freedom is. Today, our grace 
says that we have freedom to keep doing what we know we're not supposed to do and Jesus is going to forgive me. Friend, that's not grace at all. Grace does not empower you to keep repeating the same thing that broke the heart of God over and over and over. That's not grace. Grace empowers you to experience God's riches at Christ's expense. You see, it's totally different today. If you're in this house today and you're saved, say amen. amen. And, you're, and you can have something to praise about, say amen. amen. Then don't pout your lip because you lose a boyfriend. Don't pout your lip because your job's not doing what you think it ought to do. Don't pout your lip because you come in. Well, I just don't feel good. Listen, being saved is not about feeling good. It's about trusting Jesus. Now, there was a distraction. Had this feeble man. By the way, all have, all have fallen and gone astray from God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen? We are all sinners. We have all, we're all going to fall in nature. But when God fills us, He begins to do things inside. He begins to lift us up. He begins to, I want you to remember this. He begins to carry us. In Scripture, Jesus carries us. Now watch this. Only people who know they have need of something will wait for something. Only people who know they have need of something will wait for something. The sheep gate. Now, I'm going to go to this scripture, and and I'm going to be kind of going back and forth. But look in your Bibles at Hebrews 12. Just go to your right, just a few books. Stop before James. But Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And what I want to do, I want to show you that, that... what it, what it means to be in the presence of Jesus. What it means to be a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. What it means to know that I am, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And while you're looking at that verse, let me say something right here. You cannot lose your salvation. The only way you can lose your salvation is God has to take it away from you. Because He's the only one that gave it to you. And, and God is sovereign. So if God is sovereign, why would God have to make a mistake and give you something that he knew you was going to lose? I don't want to lose you there, but I'm going to tell you something. When you believe that you can lose your salvation, it ain't a matter of you losing it. It's a matter you never had it. Brother, you cannot, God is not, God's not an Indian giver. God, God is not one of these that's going to say, well, oh, I, made, I, I should never gave that to you to begin. Well, so doesn't the scripture say it would have been better off if you hadn't believed? Yeah, but those people weren't believers. Not saved. I want to make that clear. People today and their theology will teach you that you can lose your salvation. I have had it said to me that hey, I don't believe in, 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 in having the assurance of your salvation. I don't, now, guys, that's, that's a lie. That's not true. I don't believe that people have sat in their church and crossed their arms all their life are saved. I don't believe people who have never served God and worshiped God and say they're, I don't believe they're saved. I don't believe God can, yet you can experience, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you so plain today because I'm going to carry you to the wilderness tabernacle. The wilderness tabernacle is going to show you because this guy is at the entrance. Now, it's not the wilderness tabernacle, he's at the temple. But I'm going to show you what it means for us to be genuinely saved. Why? Because I want each and every one of you to know and accept the responsibility that you have of being a child of God. You have freedom in Jesus. That freedom does not mean you can live your life any way you want to. That freedom does not mean that I can just do, I can quit. I can, I'm going to tell you something. If you quit, it was you. It wasn't God. Now watch this. He says, therefore, we also, uh, Hebrews 12, 1. Now y'all going to have to hang with me, man. I'm so full. I'm, I'm, t- I'm just so full, I'm just trying to get all this out. Now Hebrews, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto who? Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's not just the beginning, he's the end. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. At this, at, at this time, lay aside, our distractions is the weight of the sin that's in our life. It's the things. So, so, well, in, I, we visited many churches. And there was a church that we visited in Charleston. 
And, and man, the guy did a great job speaking, and, 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 and it was good. They had about six or 700 people there at 8 o'clock in the morning. There was just life and people everywhere. Man, the guy got down, got ready for an invitation, and the guy just kind of continued a joke that was shared. There was at least 30, 40 people that would have got saved. If they would have just gave the invitation, the Holy Spirit was there. And here's how I know that. Here's my personal experience. If somebody would have preached that way, October 22nd, 1995, me and my wife would have got up and left that sanctuary and, not, and just and it, the seed, Satan would have snatched that seed. But that's not what happened. The, the invitation was given immediately. Why? Because we understand what the freedom means. The freedom does not a ticket to sin. A freedom is a ticket to go into the holy place. There's a difference. Now, this man is sitting there and he struggles. What's he struggling with? Well, he's struggling with his problems. I can't fix myself. You know, in the text, now I want you to remember Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 because we're going to kind of allude to that as we go through this. But he goes and he says, now there in verse 2 in, in John chapter 5 in our text, says, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, which is called, it's called Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude. Church, we, we cannot let people come visit our church and see us being mediocre in our faith. We cannot do it. We can't come in and, and, and just get in the whole humdrum of, of everything that's going on. When people come in, you know why people come and visit churches? Because they want to see if this church is alive. They want to see if people really believe what they worship. You know what that means? Don't have a conversation when the worship is going on. People are watching that. How do you know that? Because I just got through visiting four different churches and I was ready to leave one because they were so busy having a conversation and wasn't even singing. They were singing, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And they're sitting back there talking about meatloaf and oatmeal and, and sickness and all these other things. We have a problem today that we have crippled ourselves in the body of Christ because we don't realize what it means to be in the presence of God. The temple and the holy place means a meeting place. God called the church, and when he put the church together, we're his meeting place. This is a sacred place. This is a place where we come in and your children are saved, the people are saved, and people lift their hands and they cry, and, they, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they, God just does this amazing work here. But it's not the building. It's you. It's you. You have something, you have freedom inside of you. You have faith, you have power of the resurrection living inside of you this morning. That's why we don't need to be distracted. Our distraction that happens is we start thinking we have defined salvation and it's wrong. We have defined worship and it's wrong. We have defined church and it's wrong. When you start searching first, searching for a church, you're searching for a church that can give you everything, do everything. Brother, you need to be looking at what you can do for the church. Jesus has already done everything for you. Man, I love this because this guy, he had his problems and he's saying, well, Jesus, I can't fix myself. He goes on here in, in, in verse 3 and, and these lay a, a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the movement, moving of water. For an angel went down on a certain time in the pool and whoever stepped first. And you know, that's what we think today. There's people, you're sitting in this place and there's people listening on this message right now and you're thinking God can't do something in your life because of sin that's been in your life. Or God can't do something in your life because of your past. Now, if I hear one person whine about how poor they are and they're claiming to be saved, I'm going to share the gospel with you. Your riches is not. These people, the, the Egypt, they were just, the nation of Israel came out of Egypt and they didn't have nothing. They've been in slavery all of these years. And all the, all the things that are in the holy place, all the things that they were using is the riches that they took from Egypt. They melted it down and they gave it to God as their reasonable service and worship to Him. Everything about my past, my job, my, my things that's going on. Listen, I may have some problems. We are all going to have problems while we're living in a fallen world. I have a God that has overcome this world. I have a God that is bigger than my problems. I have a God that can save, heal, move, serve, and do anything in, the, in, the, in any place in anybody. You believe that? Say amen. amen. Yes. Now I'm telling you, watch this. It says your pain... He, 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 was, he, was, he was focused on his pain. Now, here's why I'm saying it. He was in the presence of Jesus, and he didn't even realize it. How 
How can you be in the presence of Jesus and not even realize it? Because you didn't really want to come. Sitting in the service, all you'll do is think about your bills that you got to pay and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, what the doctor's report was and, and, and all the things that's going on in your family and your kids and all these things. And you're sitting there and God's sitting there trying to do something and massage your heart and you can be in His presence and you don't even know it. It's sitting right beside you. And the thing that's robbing you of that is in your own mind. You're not letting God transform you into knowing that He created you to be loved and, and for Him to love you and to heal you. God, God, God knew this man had been sitting there. It says that He knew the whole time He had been laying. He knew what was wrong with Him. But this man was lame so God could get the glory for it. This man was lame because one day Jesus passed by. Every one of us in this room, we're claiming that there's a day in our life that Jesus passed by. And, and, and our lives should be the same as this man's life. The way he reacted and the way he responded. It said not only your placement, his placement, he was on a mat. He was, he was stuck to the side. And every time the angel would stir the water, he could never get there. Everybody, man, I, you know, you know that victim mentality. You know? That sometimes in church, well, I, would, I could worship God if so-and-so wouldn't sing beside me. Well, I could do this if so-and-so would lead the church. Well, I could do this. The problem's not so-and-so. The problem's you. God called you. Listen, if you want to be in the will of God and you want to follow you, you look at this verse. So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly, and do this, and you will live it ain't about us. It's about Jesus this morning. It's not about how poor you are. It's not about how rich you are. It's not about how smart you are. It's not about how much Bible verse you know. It's the fact that you believe that Jesus came, He lived, He conquered, He has victory, and He has it inside of me. Amen? Are y'all as excited as I am? Come on now. Now, <clears throat> I've got to keep my voice in the second, so I'm going to tone myself. Uh, no man is excluded from calling upon God. No man is excluded from calling upon God. The gate of salvation is set open to, unto all men. Neither is there any other thing which keepeth us back from entering in, save only our unbelief. John Calvin. I want you to listen to what I'm fixing to say. And I know there's other quotes. When you understand Calvinism and the tulip, John Calvin was dead when they did that. The tulip was formed by men. It wasn't, reformed, it wasn't formed by the grace of God. Arminianism is formed by men. It wasn't formed by the grace of God. When we believe what we believe, we believe it because Scripture says, not because somebody had a good quote. God tells me what grace is. God tells me who He loves. And God tells me who He died for. And there's not a man living, breathing anywhere who can stand at the foot of the cross and say, Oh no, this man God created to go to hell. There has never been one person created that God created. For the purpose of hell. And if anybody says other. All you got to do is do this. Then prove their case. Prove it. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what your distractions have been. But I want you to understand. If your relationship with God is not right this morning. You are the only one that's distracting you. From entering into the place that has been designed for Jesus and you. Isn't that awesome? I don't have a God that created people to torture them and kill them. I have a God that walks across and known all of his life for 38 years. This man was laying by this pool. And all through the scripture, through these miracles, it says Jesus was moved with compassion. When Jesus walks in and out, up and down the aisles, in between the chairs, and all the struggles and the things that's going on in your life this morning, Jesus is moved with compassion when he looks in your heart. 
So how can God know how I feel? Because when he was here for over 33 years, he experienced all the same feelings and the struggles and the pain and the problems and the persecution that you're experiencing right now. He knows exactly how to pray for you through the power of the Holy Spirit when you don't even know how to pray for yourself. There is no way, this going on record, there is no way that a truly saved, born-again believer can fail. We've been seeing in the news about a pastor that committed suicide. And I'm going to tell you something. When God gets a hold, I love what Ravi Zacharias had to say about that. And I want to encourage you to go read his article because it's good. When you're in ministry, man, you can be depressed. You can struggle. You know what, you know what causes your depression as a pastor? Is when you see people leave or you see people get angry and do things, you feel like you failed them. So, Brother Joey, no, no, no. Yeah. It's just like when your children get leave or they do something, you feel like in a way you'll go back in the room. You'll feel like, what did I do wrong as a parent? You see, we're all human beings. And when God shows us, these things can distract us from our thinking and what we're supposed to do. I cannot lighten up my convictions to make people who are already rebellious against God feel good about it. Because in the long run, when I get to heaven, if, I, if they have to be mad at me on earth so that I can see them in heaven, praise God. You know what I'm saying? That is a good day. But you know, if you're living for Jesus the right way, there's going to be a time that your children are not going to talk to you, your family don't like you, and your friends don't want to hang out with you. Why? Because when you get into the holy place... Your life changes. Now, the distraction came <clears throat> in his view instead of God's. That's, that's what his problem was. This guy was looking at his point of view. Well, I'm on the mat. I can't make it. Well, there's no man to move me to the water. Well, did you ask anybody? Well, you know, you see this. Number two, not only the, the distraction of the movement of God, but the disciple in the miracle, the discipleship in the miracle. This is the winning of the miracle. In verse 4, for an angel went down at a certain time of the pool and stirred up the water, and whoever stepped... So this is talking about the fit man first. Listen, it doesn't matter how fit you are, how smart you are, how strong you are, how, how long you've been a member of this church. That don't mean squat. Listen to me. You can be a legacy member and been here 50 years. You have no more grace than I do. You have no more rights than the person who just visited this church this morning. You're appreciated now. Don't get me wrong. We need people who love the body of Christ through the hard times and through the good times. You're going to have bad times. You're going to have struggles. You're going to do that. You're going to have pain. You're going to have problems. And you're going to wonder. You're going to question your placement many times. Why? Because as a church grows spiritually, let me explain it this way. Since we have been just going deeper in scripture and discipling people and other people are discipling people and things are going on you have people over here that are uh, that are spending time in bible study with people you have people over here who are who are sharing the gospel and you have people in between and saying well everybody's not made for that i'm gonna tell you something that's wrong that's a lie and you're listening to the devil uh the people in between is what other churches are filled with that are dying we think it's somebody else's job to go tell them the story. I'm going to tell you something. If you've been on a mat 38 years and you couldn't go tell somebody your testimony, you're still on the mat. You never got off of it. This guy right here, he, he, he'd been discipling and spending time. Well, I'm afraid I, I, I can't say things right. I can't do things right. I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what you can say and do, but I bet you can love them right. You know what people need? All people need to know is you'll listen to them. If you'll sit there and let them talk and listen to them, many times when I counsel people, they solve their own issues. I just sit and listen. And when, and when you listen to them, they're saying, you know, I can, you know when I disciple people, same thing. Chad, same thing. I can't believe you're taking this time with me. Why would you take this time with me to do this? I'll tell you why. Because one day I'm going to see you again in heaven, brother. Right? 
It's important that we understand. I want you to experience the freedom of what I'm talking about. Freedom is not to free you so you can be in the middle and not do anything. Freedom is so that you can exercise the power of the resurrection in your life and you can impact somebody's life somehow. That's what salvation is. And if you've never impacted somebody's life, then you're going to always doubt and question your salvation of whether or not you've had or done or seen or experienced anything. The discipleship in this miracle... Who can rob us of healing? It's us. We don't ask. We don't try. We don't believe. Or, or something happens. Listen, something's going to happen every day. If you work in a place, the devil's going to make sure something happens in your work. It just makes you mad. Why? So that you don't be productive. See, God's in your workplace just like he's in the church. Why? Because you are the church. And it's going to happen in here. Somebody's going to say something wrong or do something wrong or act wrong or this right here. Listen, you coming in here, you're coming here today to worship Jesus, not yourself. The only way you could get mad at somebody not speaking to you because you came here worshiping yourself this morning. I deserve this. I need this. Look how long I pastored this church. I deserve. You don't deserve squat, Joey Hanner. You've already been given everything that you need. You don't deserve a new office. You don't deserve this. You don't deserve, you don't deserve nothing. But I'm going to bless you anyway. Cheryl caught me. I came out here and was trimming the bushes. I didn't want to get caught. I get out there and my eyes was just, I thought it was sweat for a while. And then after a while, I like Jeremy Ward. I done started leaking. And, and, and I wanted, to, I, wanted to, I wanted to serve the church because the church gives you a sabbatical and you get to do that. I wanted to do something. I needed to do something to give back. I needed to do something. So I came and I got to thinking. Every time we drove up to a place to visit it, I looked at the outside because whatever was on the ins- outside made me think if this is how they represent the Lord on the inside. I want people to know when they drive up this driveway, man, these guys was out here mowing grass. Man, they were, I, I, never knew, I did not know you could go 50 mile an hour on a lawnmower. I'm going to have to put a speed bump in the grass. I mean, it is, but these cats, I mean, they're going everywhere. They're, they're mowing. They're getting it done. And I'm sitting there saying most churches hire people to do it. You know what they're doing? They're robbing somebody of a, of a, of a blessing. They're robbing somebody. They come and they sit and they, they, write, they pray. How do I know they pray? I could feel it. I could feel it. I could feel it while I was trimming the bush. I could, I could feel it. And then I got through with these bushes on the other side. And I said, man, that looks so good. I can't leave them on the front like that. I was wore out. But you know what I did? Got me some water. Went ahead and just went right on. Just did it. You know what? I didn't do it to be seen. I didn't do it anything. I did it because of my gratitude. U3B is a great church. It's an awesome church. Church, you don't... Y'all don't know... I've been to Ford. I'm telling you, you don't know. You're not going to go. You're, it's not out there. And it doesn't matter how the lights are and how the worship and the music and the, and, 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 and the guy standing up there in skinny jeans. It don't matter. If the Spirit of God is not flowing, you, you can't create that. And when the Spirit of God is flowing, He's trying to let us have an intimate moment. And the only way you can have an intimate moment is the holy place. He told him in verse 7, Do you want to be made well? And he said, But I have no one to place me in. Today, my question is, Do you want to be saved? Do you want to feel saved? Do you want, do you want to know you're saved? And I was thinking about that. How could I go for 30 years of my life and know all about church and not know all about Jesus? How did that happen? I just don't want to make those same mistakes as we see now. Now, the expression of salvation in the discipleship. I want to show you, I want to show you the picture of the wilderness tabernacle. If you guys could pull that up. And I want to show you this. Now, <laughs> this is powerful stuff. Now, remember, this is the wilderness tabernacle. This is not the temple in which they were talking about here. This is an analogy I'm going to show you. There's a gate of entrance. That's where the, 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 the bull or the sheep 
whatever, would come through. Well, that was the sheep's gate. That gate was designed for all the thousands of sheep that were going, probably six to 700,000 in one day was going to be persecuted, not persecuted, you don't, uh, but going to be slaughtered. And their blood was caught, and they're, they're, they go to this brazen altar. And on that brazen altar that is consumed, and, and, and it's on behalf of the sin of the people, and they would do this. And all these people had their lamb without blemish, a, a year old. And, and, and many believe, remember the sheep's gate, the pool at the sheep's gate, they thought, well, that was the wash. And I'm not sure about all that, but I can tell you this. Then you go to the brazen laver. And the brazen labor right here, now everything inside the holy place is gold. Everything on the outside is bronze. The holy place has solid gold. The, 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 um, the candlestick weighed 75 pounds of solid gold. And it wasn't used as a candlestick, it was oil. It was olive oil. That's what they used and that's what they would burn. Now I want to show you. It says they go in and the brazen altar. That was the sacrifice. When it went there, the brazen labor, that is a picture of how they had to prepare and cleanse themselves. Head to toe, man. They had to, get, they had to prepare themselves before they could go through that veil. There's a veil there. And, and, and just anybody wasn't going through that. You had, to, you, had to, you had to, there were some requirements. Church, the same as today. Say, well, Brother Joey, how did Jesus carry us? 1 John 2.2, 2, that he, he, he is for propitiation for our sins, not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Jesus carried you when he carried his cross. Jesus was carrying us when he carried that cross. When he carried that cross, he became our sacrifice. That means he carries us. You Listen, you're not going in that door because you decide to go in that door. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says in Scripture, I am the door. He says, I am the light. He tells us over and over, but we think that when I'm good, I'm sorry. I'm just going to go right in. It's not like that. When God draws you, it is powerful movement of God. Man, when He gets a hold of you, salvation is powerful. And it takes away and melts away all the impurities. And it takes away all the things that you're guilty of. And it removes the guilt. And He picks you up and He takes you by the brazen altar. He takes you to the labor. And you're understanding because of what He's done, you know that you, have, you can do out of obedience. Because I have been cleaned by the blood of Jesus. That water in that baptistry does not clean you. The blood of Jesus cleans you. And it's when you go through that labor, I'm clean. Why do I know I can be baptized? Because I know I am forgiven. This morning I'm forgiven. Jesus don't do anything halfway and He don't miss anybody. When you believe John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Friend, it's already been done. It's already set in motion. The sacrifice on behalf of all the world is in place. The only way you can receive that is through faith. Through faith, you can know Jesus really came. He really conquered. He really did all those things. So, now here's a point. The making of a disciple. That's powerful. You can't get in that gate unless Jesus carries you. He's not your sacrifice unless you realize that He gave His life. If you'd have been the only person living, Jesus would have still died on Calvary. Woo! Huh? Yes! Man, isn't that amazing? Look up at me and everybody smile. Just smile, that's right. Act like you got some teeth in your head. Come on. I'm telling you that it doesn't matter what the devil did this week to me. Jesus has already done everything that I need to, res to have victory, to have freedom. What's freedom? Whoa, now hang on. Y'all ready? If you say you're free, say amen. amen. Freedom is for you to go to the holy place. If you don't walk in the holy place, 
You'll never experience the anointing of God. You'll never experience the promises of God. You'll never become the light of the world. And that is your freedom is to walk through that place. Grace is not freedom for you to sit in this church, sit in that chair, don't ever do anything for God. Well, I've got my salvation. I prayed that prayer like everybody else said. I am good. You are good when you are there. And until you go there, you're never going to have any confidence of what we're supposed to do. What is it Hebrews told us? Look at that. Lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Look it unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the glory of God, the mercy seat. The, the, the altar of incense, the table of showbread, the, the candlestick. But you couldn't get to none of those things till you get to the oil. What did it say in Scripture that happened? Uh, I, I'm going I'm to read this for you. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having holy boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, to enter the holiest, to, to boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You're not going in the Holy of Holies because you went to be baptized. You're not going into the Holy of Holies because somebody sprinkled water on the cross. You're going in the Holy of Holies because every drop of blood, of sacred divine blood, was shed for you. You're not a mistake. You're not a problem. And you're not a pain. Well, some of us may be. But, but anyhow, we just move right on because God forgives us. Amen? Now, now he tells, listen to this, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil. What's the veil? It says through the veil that is his flesh. The veil might have been torn from top to bottom that man had made, but the veil that has been put in place right now is the one God made. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except through me. The only way you go to the holy place is you go through Jesus. But friend, if you don't want to read your Bible, that's okay. But you're not going in the holy place till you do. If you don't want to hide thine word that I might not sin against thee, you're not going into the holy place until you do. Understand salvation. You can't just get a piece of it and say, I want this, but I don't want this. That's not the way the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit finishes. Jesus finishes. He is the author and He is the finisher of our faith. What that means when a person is saved, He lives saved, He talks saved, He acts saved. And sometimes I have a problem when we get to talking about this thing where people want to get together and talk about their sin. Praise God, devil, get you behind me. I don't want to, I hate sin. I hate the things that I do that I know I'm not supposed to do. And I'm certainly not going to sit around and glorify my sin in front of God. That's the reason we can't worship. You see, now the discipleship in this miracle, he told him, he said, take up your bed and walk in verse 6. And Jesus, do you want to be well? And the sick man answered, sir, I have no man to put me in a pool. The water is stirred up, but while I, I, I am coming, another steps in in front of me. Jesus says, rise, take up your bed and walk. Why did he tell him to take up his bed and walk? This is the expression of salvation. Uh, <laughs> Jesus carries us through the gate. He says, I'm the door. All the way through, he does this. Why did he carry his mat? Because he wasn't coming back to it again. Here's what salvation in the Baptist church looks like for so many people. That mat is what I took to the altar last week that I repented of, that God forgave me of. Well, this week, you're going to have to bring that same mat back and get back on it again. That's not scriptural. It's a struggle, and you need to have the responsibility that it's a struggle, and you haven't repented of it if it's still in your weak life this week. When you repent of it, you get out of it. You're done with it. Well, Brother Joey, you don't understand. You don't know what it's like for that. You don't know what... Listen, I don't have to know what it's like. Sin is sin. God has free, gave you freedom. And that freedom promises you deliverance. Just like He delivered the nation of Israel out of bondage, He will deliver you. And every time you go back, you and the devil went back. Jesus didn't do it. It's you. It's you. It's you. And He says this morning, you can have freedom. I will deliver you. I will take you into the promised land of milk and 
honey, and you can experience my riches. And you will go in and you will never regret it. You will never regret one day with me. Then he goes and he says to the disciple, because of the miracle. Here, the, the wonder of this miracle in verse 10. The Jews therefore said to him, who is cured? It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful. Right here, basically what he's saying. He said, man, I don't know who, who healed me. All I know is I can walk. I don't know all about these scriptures. I don't know everything in the Bible. I don't know who the Sunday school teacher is. I don't know the name of the preacher. I don't know all those other... All I know is I was doing this, and now I'm doing this. My life has changed. Brother, that's what stupid saved is. When I was saved, I was stupid saved. I didn't understand church words. I didn't understand propitiation. I didn't understand sanctification. I didn't want to understand those words. I wanted somebody to have an easier word that made sense. Amen? But in this, God starts to work through us. And now, what happens? God cannot overflow blessings in this congregation until this congregation becomes a blessing. That means every born-again believer, it is required of you to walk into the Holy of Holies. Brother Joy, only the priest can do that. I'm sorry, friend, but we have a high priest today. There is no man on two legs that's ever going to make a sacrifice for my sins. Jesus already did that. Amen? Here, the faithful man, he received a miracle of the body. Then he received a miracle of the soul. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. You didn't have to tell him to go to the temple. He'd never been able to go in the temple before. He couldn't walk in. He couldn't go in. He was on the outside. They was in doing everything and just left him out there. Nobody would go knock on his door. Nobody would go visit him. Nobody would love him. Nobody would say anything. Today we have a community dying and going to hell. They're dying. And all they've seen is back... I don't even think backslidden is scriptural. All they've seen is Baptist people practice pain problems and placement. They've never seen victory. And when people see victory that are supposed to be right with God, the first thing they do is have envy and jealousy. Sin. But instead of us realizing what's supposed to be happening and having this burden that we're supposed to have, this God makes us a disciple. What does a disciple do? That we love others who are not where we are and we don't look down on them and we don't talk down to them and we love them up to Jesus. That's what we do. But our problem is not them. Our problem is people in the church and they're still one of them and they're thinking they're one of us. And you're not. When you get into the holy of holies, brother, there's some things that we need to realize. It is a picture of the cross. What changed this man? Or better yet, who changed this man? Can I tell you, did the man ever get in the pool? People coming to a church and they're sitting in church and you're waiting on God to do something. He's already done it. Teenagers, it's already be done. If you're more concerned about being popular at school, you will be. The devil will make sure that he gives you the power to be the most popular person in high school. Why? Because you're coming and sitting in church every Sunday. He will give you more power than you've ever seen. He'll make you rich. He'll give you the cutest, deceitful, disguised little boy you've ever seen. And by the way, these boys that act like that are little boys. One of these days, maybe they'll grow up and be a man. I know some of them are little boys and they're 20-something years old and they still hadn't become a man yet. You see, God has showed us a disciple because of this miracle, because of what happened. It was not the movement of the water. He never stepped into the pool. It was Jesus that changed him. He was not there to lay on a mat when he came into the temple. Why did he go to the temple? What did he do when he went to the temple? I'll tell you, he went there to talk about what happened to him. He went there to talk about, I'm not on a mat anymore. Hey, I can walk around just as good as you can. You guys are so proud in your ephods and your little hats. You need to be a, like a doughboy, chef boy RD. Now, I got Jesus in my life, brother. You ain't talking down on me. I, I, I got the same Jesus you have. Brother, when we come to church, we ought to just be excited that God is doing something now. It says our reasonable service in, in Romans 12, 1 and 2 because now we begin to see He carries us by the altar. He carries us by the brazen, by, by the labor. 
And, and, but the rest of the way, we walk through the power of the Holy Spirit. And really, by the labor, we walk through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're being baptized because it's God that's opened our mind to make us realize, what are we baptized? When a person is baptized, what are they baptized into? Huh? When a person is baptized, what are they baptized into? The body of Christ. That's the whole purpose of baptism. The purpose of baptism is to identify you with the death and the burial of resurrection of Jesus Christ and is to baptize you and for you to realize your responsibility of obedience because that's your first step of obedience. But if it, did, if it stopped when you were baptized, then you lied to God. Why? Because after that, you go through the veil that was torn from top to bottom. Now I have just a few more minutes. And I know you might have been daydreaming or, or thinking about all these things, but I, don't want you, I want you to get your mind in right here. And for the next five minutes, I want you to give me your heart. And I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit of God talk to you. Because I'm going to show you what is in every true born-again believer. If it's not in you, you're just going to have to decide where you are. That's between you and the Lord. I can't do anything about that. I can share with you, but I can tell you this. Being born again is the most powerful thing, the most powerful movement of God you will ever experience. It's not when you went in the pool. It's when Jesus moved in you. Our reasonable service in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it talks about that. Be transformed and be holy. Be holy. That means we're supposed to be holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 tells us that we're supposed to be a holy people. That we're supposed to live that way. and we're supposed, to, we're supposed to be holy as He is holy. That is your responsibility. That is my responsibility. This whole nonsense of thinking since I'm saved, I can do whatever I want to and I can ask God to forgive you. If you're just thinking that, you are an indictment to the Holy Spirit of God. That is not true. That sounds like, well, I'm not going to say that. The first thing is the oil. You have to go by the oil before you could go into the holy place. The oil is a picture of the power of the Holy Spirit. We are all supposed to be God's royal. It was that song, man. That last song we sang, preach this message. We are a royal priesthood. We are a royal people. Why? Because we have, in, we have inherited a royal place. It has been, God has already promised us these things. And, and it's the oil at the entrance. You had to be anointed to enter. What is this a picture of? Hang on. Every single person in this room is supposed to be intimate with Jesus. I mean intimate. When you're only one way you can be in, you can you can be intimate with Jesus and you're going to have to empty yourself of yourself and quit acting self-centered and being full of yourself and your opinions if your opinions has not saved your family and saved you changed you at all you need to give the you need to give that to the devil and you need to run to Jesus with all your heart because if it hasn't changed you by now you're never going to change because you don't have the power to enter the holy place. The only way you can enter the holy place. That's why we stress small groups. That's why we stress Bible study. That's why we stress discipleship. And most people just want to come to church. You want to come to service and you want to leave. Praise God. Nobody's going to twist your arm. You leave. But you will never enter the holy place by having a mindset that you just don't want to go deeper. You have a responsibility this morning that God through the power of the Holy Spirit, is going to prompt you to go deeper. You're going to want to know more. That anointing, that oil that comes, that is what stirs us. We always know that I've been set apart. Ephesians 2.10, that God prepared in advance the works that He wanted me to do. And when I walked through that veil, that was when that work began. Teenagers, this lie where I've seen teenagers being baptized and you're being saved and you go to school and you get out and you talk like everybody else, you do like everybody else, you're not in the holy place. I'm not saying you don't know the labor. I'm not saying you don't know the brazen altar. I'm just saying you haven't entered the holy place yet. Then at the holy place, you also see... That the candlestick, the candlestick is the only thing that lit the room. It, it, it's powerful. 
And when you, when you go in, it, it had seven, six, three on one side, three on the water, and one goes right up in the center, and it was olive oil. And it was their job to all, you could never go out. It was the only thing that provided light into the holy place. And, 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 and that's a picture. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, John 8, 12. And he also tells us that we are supposed to be the light of the world. Why? Because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. Because he did for us what he did, we can do for him what he's asked us to do. We can do it. Church, if you believe we can do it, say amen. amen. Then get on that white horse and ride it, brother. I'm telling you, he has called us. The next thing is the table of showbread. And then, by the way, here's John 8, 12. Jesus is the light of the world. In him there is no darkness at all. That means he never sinned. Never no sin found in him. You will not have to walk in darkness because you have the light that leads to life. That's what's in the intimate place with God. Then you have the table of showbread. God keeps his promise. He came to seek and save and he is going and he's coming again. If you believe Jesus is coming back, say amen. And the reason you know he's coming back, if there's a part of you that don't want Jesus to come back right now, we're going to give an invitation and you can get saved. That's the only thing that makes you think that way. You have this fear that if he comes back right now, you don't know where you're going to spend your eternity. There's another picture that I want to show you. And I want you to look at this because this demonstrates everything. Now, you've, this is a picture of the armor of God. It's a picture of the utensils in the holy place. And it's a picture of the cross. And I want you to look at it at the feet of Jesus, the shoes of the gospel. That, that's, that's the very beginning. The cross is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. If the cross offends you, if the, you are offended by the gospel, if you are offended at sharing the gospel, brother, you have a problem. I ain't saying you don't not have a fear of it. I'm just saying you act offended. That you have the brazen altar. That brazen altar is what you walk by when you first go into, through the sheep gate, through that place. Then it goes up and you see the, the girded with truth. That, that we see, they see the brazen labor that when we wash ourselves, we become clean. We've seen the breastplate of righteousness. And then you see the altar of incense. I didn't get to the altar of incense. The altar of incense holds the coals from the brazen altar. They would take the coals from that brazen altar. They put it on the altar of incense and it was never supposed to go out. That is like a fray. That's supposed to be our work for God. How we serve Him. How pleased. How we give Him glory by what we do. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't ever quit. Don't ever let up. Because you are in the hole. When you let up, you are no longer intimate. You are no longer intimate. Now, I'm not talking about people with health problems. And I'm not talking about those days. There are people that are laying, that are struggling, that are sick today. They would beat some of you up to get to do some stuff. But, but they, they can't because of their physical abilities. They absolutely cannot. But praise God, there's going to have to be a generation that raises up today that become those people. That becomes those kind of people who serve and who work and who love not coming to church just because this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm not coming to church because this is just what my tradition tells me. I'm coming to Jesus because this is what He tells me. He tells me that this is the only way. He tells me this is how, this is my reasonable service. You go into and you see the, the candlestick and the, and, and the table of showbread is a promise that Jesus is coming back. He is our provider. He, he is our provision. He is the one. That, he's our promise. He gives it to you. You see the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant in the holy place is a picture of prayer. Of prayer. Manna was in there. All good things come from above. When you get into the holy place and you're intimate with God, man, you pray to Him. He hears you. He listens. And if it's according to His will, He will answer you. You believe that? Say amen. Man, this is good stuff. Once a year, the high priest would sprinkle blood on behalf of a nation. Brother Joey, how can this be a picture of prayer? If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, which means sin no more. 
When you realize you are doing something in your life that's sin, the Word of God commands you to repent of it and turn away from it. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I'm not talking about the United States of America. And I'm not talking about Union 3 Baptist Church. I'm talking about your address, your home, your residence. Revival will not start here before it starts in your home. That's where revival will start. You see, that's the way God wanted his movement to begin with. He didn't want the guy to focus on the water. He was in the presence of Jesus the whole time and he didn't even realize it. And Jesus had compassion on him. And in a sense, he picked him up. Now I know that's before Calvary. But he picked that man up. Did he have to do it physically? No. He could do it spiritually. He spiritually healed that man through the power of what his goal was. And that was for him to sin no more. He walked through. And he experienced the power of of the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it was coming. Jesus has already promised us these things. You know what each and every one of us is supposed to do? We come in this church to tell everybody what God did and how he got us off that mat. I'm not on that mat anymore. Barry, go ahead and come on up. I'm not on the mat anymore. He got me off the mat. I'm not sick anymore. See, God healed. Has your salvation anointed you? Has it empowered you? Has it healed you? You want to know how to pray for our country? The illustration that I just gave you. This is what crossed my mind this morning. Who is the person that this really made? I don't want you to miss tonight. If there's any way I want you to come. There's a hymn that we're going to talk about tonight. I know whom I have believed. There's a story behind this hymn that is so powerful. That it changed my heart just to prepare it. Today our churches are in indictment on our hymns. Because the people singing them are not leading people to Jesus. Every hymn that is powerful was written by someone who sacrificed their whole life to lead somebody to Jesus. I don't want to give the way to kicker tonight. But I feel like I'm supposed to say something this morning. This young man was asked to pray. And he was, he was reading the Bible that his mama gave him. Just a little New Testament. But when she asked him to pray, this young man was dying. He just said, I hadn't done that before. But he went ahead and he went through with it. And when he knelt down to pray, he didn't pray for the young man who was dying. He prayed for himself to be saved. Do you know how many people today that say they're saved and they're born again and they're in the holy place and they're intimate with God and if you ask them to pray a blessing over the food, they couldn't do it? Is there anybody in this room right now, if I was to ask you to stand up and pray, and you would absolutely be terrified? If it's your personality with crowds, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your fear of being able to do it. Jesus says there's no fear in him, and the power of the Holy Spirit will give you strength. That when a person gets that way, here's my whole point, and I'll close. If he had never been confronted to do and ask what he was supposed to do he would have never experienced 
the salvation that can only come from God. When you are saved, somebody's going to come to you and they're going to ask you to do something. A lot of people in church ask you to do a lot of things. Some of it's God and some of it's man. 90, 110% of the time, every born-again believer, when you're saved, God is going to send somebody in your life and he's going to do it. He's going to ask you to do something that you think you can't do. And it's going to be a test. And all I'm going to do is tell you this. The greatest intimacy with God that you've ever experienced is going to happen when you push through that fear and you do what you know he wants you to do. Not only will it affect your life, but it may affect the life of somebody who's fixing to die. This idea of thinking when you're saved and I'm saved, I can just sit back and let everybody else do it. You need to read another Bible. I know this is corny, but it came to my mind, so I'm just going to say it. I've said it before. They've been doing that. I know this is not the best analogy of a movie, but it's that nobody puts baby in a corner. Do you have any idea how precious you are to God? He's not going to put you in a corner. He's going to put you out on display. And he's going to say, this is what I can do. If you're here and you've never experienced the power of salvation in your life, your heart is under conviction right now. You come. And you experience the life that God wants you to have. If you are saved, and you know and you've been kind of had a wall in front of you, it's time for you to go to the mercy seat. And it's time for you to realize why that blood was shed for you. Because it has the power to remove your pain. It has the power to remove problems. Or at least help you have the strength to go through them. And it has the problem to get your mind off your placement. You're a child of the God Most High. He has great things in store for you. Hey guys, I'm the pastor of Union 3. My name is Joey Hanner. And... Uh, we are so thankful that you've been able to listen to the message today. But I want you to know that God has a plan for your life. And today, when we think about salvation, uh, I was one of those church members, one of those people that said I prayed when I was younger, and, uh, but my life did not change. When, we, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, your life will change. God has a plan for your life. You see, He created you for heaven, but you can't earn or deserve that because heaven is a perfect place. And God says, I'm not going to let one sin into heaven. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we think about sin, we think about murder, we think about stealing. But the sin is what we think is, is our thought life. And we are just sinful by nature. And but Jesus came where it doesn't have to be that way. God loves us. He said, I'll solve that problem. I'm going to send my son Jesus. He sent his son for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have what? Everlasting life. You see, God came to give you life. And he wants us to be more than a church member. He wants us to be more than someone that prayed a prayer, said a decision. Praying a prayer is the greatest power there is because that is our tool and the instrument God give us to repent. He said, if you'll repent, and he said, times of refreshing will come in your life. You see, in our life, God looks at us, but he can't see, he can see us. We can't have a relationship with him because this sin separates us from God. When we take and we have intellectual, we know that God exists. We have intellectual faith, but we just believe that he's there, but we don't really have a relationship with him. Uh, we have temporal faith. Temporal faith is, well, God, I tell you what, if you'll fix this in my life, I'll turn my life around. Well, where does my sin go? It doesn't go anywhere. Well, God, I tell you what, if you'll do this in my life, I promise you I'll turn over a new leaf. It'll go for a little while, and it'll just, we'll go right back into the same old, same old. Why? Because we think we can change ourselves. Friend, you can't change yourself. 
If you could, you would have already done it. Only thing that can change your life is by God's grace. He came into this world so that you could have life and have it more abundantly. That's why the scripture says, all like sheep have gone astray, each into his own way. But God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, he takes his sin, he casts it as far as the east is from the west. And there's one mediator. His name is Christ Jesus. The Bible teaches that. It also teaches in first or in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. So can you go to a time in your life that you trusted Jesus? If you never have, you can do it by just saying, Jesus, I'm sorry. I repent of my sin. I ask you to be my Lord and be my Savior. I am trusting you today to save me. And you will be my Lord and be my Savior. If you've done that today, we're proud of you. And we'd love to hear from you here at Union 3. Go to u3bchurch.com or just call the church office and let someone know, 256-494-9180. We would love to hear from you. And thank you again for watching here at Union 3 Baptist Church. We love you, and we have a great big old life.